Today on Earth Focus, oceans under threat. Marine scientist Nancy Knowlton on acidification and other challenges facing the world's oceans. Coming up on Earth Focus. Dr. Nancy Knowlton, why are the oceans and the creatures that live in them so important to humanity? Well, oceans cover 70% of the surface of the Earth and actually about 95% of the habitable real estate. So just by virtue of their enormous scale, they're, they have huge effects on everything from climate to providing food, providing wonderful places for people to enjoy themselves, and also important uh, compounds, medicines that can potentially come from the sea as well. It's, it, the ocean affects our economy from the top to the bottom. Why exactly are coral reefs so important? Coral reefs are often called the rainforests of the sea, and they have a huge amount of diversity in them. About one quarter of all living species are thought to be associated with reefs, but their actual area is remarkably small. If you took all coral reefs and squashed them down into a little space, they'd only be about the size of Texas or France. So you've got this huge amount of diversity in a very small space, but that space is predominantly along the coastlines of developing countries. And so even though the total area is small, it's incredibly important to have healthy coral reefs for the economy of many, many developing countries. In, the, in Baja California, in Mexico, a small village decided to set up a marine protected area because they could see their fisheries declining. And they also came to realize that tourists like to see big fish when they go in the water. So they set up this marine protected area. The fish uh, numbers and, and weight quadrupled, so it's actually arguably the most successful marine protected area on the planet. Uh, but in terms of the economy, it has, it's bringing in about $18,000 per person to this village, which is well above the Mexican average. Coral reefs are actually living creatures themselves, aren't they? Coral reefs are a living thing. They're the largest living construction. They can actually be, be seen from outer space. But they're built by very simple organisms that just have a mouth and a ring of tentacles and a few other essential organs inside. But they're like little tiny miniature tin cans with an opening at the top, which is the mouth. And they're very, it's a very thin layer of living tissue that covers the skeleton underneath. And those organisms slowly, over time, add more and more skeleton, and they build up this giant cement wall, which we call a coral reef. What is it that's threatening the survival of coral reefs? Corals are certainly highly threatened. It's been estimated that one third of all coral species may be at risk of extinction uh, due to the combined effects of climate change and ocean acidification and overfishing and poor water quality. Uh, in the Caribbean, for example, it's been estimated that about 80 per we've lost about 80 percent of the living coral in the last 30 years. And the situation in the Pacific is not quite as bad, but it's basically going down the same trajectory. The causes are pretty straightforward. Uh, and they are all associated with things that people do. And then the big challenge to reefs, uh, which is we're already feeling now but will really increase in the future, is the role of carbon dioxide, which both heats up the ocean and it makes it more acidic. Corals, as it turns out, are very, very sensitive to even small increases in temperature. Two degrees Fahrenheit or a degree centigrade causes something called coral bleaching. If serious and uh, prolonged, can lead to massive amounts of coral death. And the second thing that carbon dioxide does is it dissolves in the ocean and makes the ocean more acidic. And in a more acidic ocean, it's much harder for organisms to secrete their skeletons. And so corals have a much harder time doing what they're supposed to do. There are some critics of global warming in general, but you don't hear quite as much doubt raised about ocean acidification. Why is that? Well, of course, the situation with global warming has become very uh, politicized in a way. Uh, the, actually, there's not that much debate. There's really no serious debate about the r role of humans in terms of global warming. Um, but it is true that the, the effects of carbon dioxide on the chemistry of the ocean are a little bit more straightforward than calculating the details of the effects of carbon dioxide on, on the warming of the atmosphere. And so the, the, the chemistry part of the is pretty straightforward. What's less straightforward in terms of understanding the effects of 
ocean acidification, as it's called, is that, that how organisms actually respond. And that's partly because we haven't been studying ocean acidification for very long. Uh, it's only been a matter of a decade or so that we've actually worried about the ocean becoming more acidic. How fast is the process of acidification happening? The ocean is already now more, 30% uh, more acidic than it was before the Industrial Revolution began. But the impacts are likely to get uh, particularly severe a little bit further out, say by 2050. It's not, but 2050 is not that far away when you think about it. We worry about um, things like Social Security running out of funds in that, the same kind of time frame. So it's, it's happening on the same kind of time frame that we worry about with respect to other issues. So it's, it may seem far away in a way, but it's not. And the problem is that carbon dioxide stays in the atmosphere for hundreds of years. So by failing to act now, we, every year we fail to act, we make uh, it harder and harder to solve the problem well. What are the things that are disturbing the balance of life in the ocean? There's also the problem of invasive species because we move things from place to place in our ships and in our when we move things for purposes of aquaculture, say uh, lots there are little hitchhikers that are in this in with what we're trying to move. And sometimes those invasive species can have catastrophic effects. For example, there's a there's an invasive seaweed is taking over big chunks of the Mediterranean and drastically reducing biodiversity as a consequence. And in the Caribbean, um, there's something called the lionfish, which apparently escaped from an aquarium. And uh, it has now completely expanded throughout the entire Caribbean. And the biggest problem with lionfish is that they're, they're predators and they eat baby fish. And the Caribbean is already tremendously overfished and the lionfish are essentially scooping up what little remains. So they're a big problem as well. So what can be done about this? The ocean's a big place, and it has a certain amount of resilience. The, the problem is we're doing so many different things to it at the same time, between overfishing, poor water quality, invasive species, global warming, and ocean acidification. And the combined effects are really too much for any ecosystem, even one as large as the ocean, to really uh, make it. You're describing an existential threat to humanity, nothing less. Well, we are, I, I, I think as a species, we are reaching the limits of what, we, we've passed the limits of what we can safely extract from our home. And we don't have any other home to go to. This is planet Earth, or I like to think of it as planet ocean. Um, and we have to live within our means. The principle of living within our means applies to ecology just as much as it applies to budgets. Nancy Knowlton, thank you very much. My pleasure. channel of uncompromising stories, world news, documentaries, entertainment, and culture. Link TV, connecting you to the world. For more information, visit linktv.org.